I'm afraid that I'm going to have to speak to you in English. My Romanian is limited to Ursus. <laughs> and when I'm asked if I want another one, I can say da. <laughs> so, and I also have a shopping list because I have to bring Ursus home for my husband. Um, I don't know, does anyone in here, or is anyone in here familiar with what MOOCs are? See, raise of hands, half hands, a few hands. 2012 was deemed the year of the MOOC, and that's when MOOCs became very popular. But the concept of MOOCs have really been around for a long time. When I first started university for the first time, and like most American students, I flunked out the first time, not because I was going to all of the bars and the nightclubs like all my peers were. I was too boring. I was going to the library. I was going to classes that I wasn't registered for because I thought I was at university to learn. Well, it turns out that I was actually at university to get a degree. And to get a degree, they don't particularly care if you learn anything. They just want to make sure that you go to the right classes that they tell you that you have to take to get your degree in history, journalism, mathematics, whatever. You must take these classes. I didn't always want to take those classes. I wanted to take other classes. So I would go to those other classes, and I'd sit in, and I'd learn a lot. But it wasn't necessarily what I was supposed to be learning for my degree in history. So at the end of the first year, the dean called me into his office, and he said, you have not had a very successful year here. And I said, I've had a very successful year, my first semester. I took a PhD level class in medieval Norman England and France history. And he goes, but you're a freshman. You're not supposed to take a PhD level class. I was like, why? I was a rebel. <laughs> and he said, be a rebel. But you'll have to wait a year, take a year out, <laughs> then come back. So what happened was I did. I took my year out, and I worked a job that I found out that I did not want to have to do that kind of work. So I think I needed to get a degree. So I had to grow up enough to learn to where I had to go to the classes that they told me I had to go to so I could get my degree so I wouldn't have to work for an insurance company. I, I, I can now proudly say I've had many, many, many jobs in my life, but I have never had to work for an insurance company again. Okay, so MOOCs. MOOCs are based on the concept that we should take classes in subjects that we are interested in. But you're not going to get a a degree for it. You're not going to get accreditation for it. But guess what? You're not going to pay for it either, which is really cool because I can go and I can take that class in Norman, French, British, medieval history. And by the way, I know a lot about Norman, French, and English medieval history. But I can take that because I don't have to worry about getting credit for it. I can get credit for it if I want to, but it isn't going to go towards a degree. But I will learn. So I don't know how well y'all can see this. Um, so what are MOOCs? Well, as we said, MOOC stands for Massive Online Open 
coarse. Massive. What does massive? Think about being in a class 30,000 students. Think about teaching a class of 30,000 students. I'm a professor. I have a hard time sometimes teaching a class of 10. But the difference between the students who are taking a MOOC and the students who are taking my class for credit is the students who enroll on a MOOC are enrolling on it because they want to learn something. But 90% of them will not complete. As a professor, I don't really care. Because those 10%, those 3,000 <laughs> students that I can reach is a lot more than I can ever have in a lecture hall. I cannot have 3,000 students in here. So the fact that 20,000 of them may stick around for half the semester, may stick around for one class. I've reached 3,000 students with my wisdom. <laughs> and I'm very wise. Now, the way that MOOCs are set up, it's set up like every other college class. You know, when you were at university, not every class was the same. You had good instructors. You had bad instructors. You had instructors that you sat in the back of the class and you read a book. But you went to class because they were taking role is to make sure you were there. So you were there physically, but you weren't really there. Well, with the MOOCs, because they're distance learning classes, some instructors will have video where they have a talking head. Some instructors will have PowerPoint where they talk over the PowerPoint. Most all of them will have some type of video lecture, whether it's a talking head video lecture or whether it's a PowerPoint lecture. There will be some point of video lecture two or three times a week. And MOOCs are set up different from traditional correspondence courses where you actually have to do things within the weeks that they tell you to do them. They're very short, usually seven to nine weeks, and they move very fast. They will have homework that, you to do, that you want, they want you to do. It's all machine graded, computer graded, so you they'll have some multiple choice questions, you answer them, Immediately you get feedback as to what you got right, what you got wrong. Um, the, and those are the type of homework assignments and those are the type of tests they have. Because obviously as an instructor, I cannot grade 30,000 essays. I don't want to read 30,000 essays. Now who started MOOCs? MOOCs were started by Harvard University and MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And they started this concept of they have some of the best professors in the world. And nobody other than these few Harvard and MIT students ever get to hear those lectures. And that's a shame, isn't it? So let's take these best professors that we've got and let's put them online for anybody who wants to take that course, to take that course. What are some of the courses that you can take? Pick a topic, any topic, it's probably being offered. They have some that are offered that you can, they're actually looking at that you can apply for credit. So you can have a course from Harvard, that you actually get academic credit for it. Guess what? That's not free. Because in reality, education really is free. There is nothing to stop you from going to the public library and picking up any book you want and reading it and teaching yourself. When we go to university, what are we paying for? We're not paying for the teaching. You really aren't paying for the teaching. You're paying for that credential, that diploma that in the States we so proudly frame 
and hang up in our office so that if you are a doctor, your patients know, hey, you actually went to medical school. Um, and as a professor, my students go, wow, you actually have that many degrees. And I go, yeah, I was a real geek. Um, but I flunked out of university the first time. Didn't the second. Um, I've taken some MOOCs. Uh, I decided that after so many years of being an academic and writing papers um, and always looking around for someone who really knew statistics <laughs> to work on my papers with me, that I needed to go and retake some of the statistics classes that I had when I was working on my master's and my PhD. So I signed up for this statistics class, and I think I made it for two and a half weeks. And then I said, now I know why I hated statistics when I took it at, when I had to. But in that two and a half, three weeks, I actually enjoyed what I was doing. I like the concept of statistics. I don't like the fact that we have to sit there and do math to get there. You know? There's got to be a way of doing statistical analysis that doesn't, doesn't involve mathematics. Now, the thing about MOOCs and the thing about any kind of distance learning is it encompasses this view that we have that's called lifelong learning. And that is something that the U.S. embraced about 40 years ago when universities realized that, ooh, that pool of 18 to 22-year-olds is getting smaller, and that's where we get most of our money from. Ah! We'll say lifelong learning, come to university at any age. So in the States, they did this massive thing starting about 40 years ago where they reached out to people who had started university and flunked out, like some people. But it was like, come back. Come back to university at any age and get your degree. You can come back and pay $10.00 to take a class, you won't get credit for it, but come back because they knew that if they got you to come back for $10, you'd get hooked. And you'd decide, I want that degree. So then they get you for your money to come back and get that piece of paper that you can put up on your wall. But the difference is that when we are 18 to 22, all we think about really is the paper on the wall. We're not really concerned with what we're learning. You know, I mean, as a professor, I think if I had 10 lay, I had to translate this, if I had 10 lay for every time a student said, is this going to be on the test? <laughs> as I have, you know, sweated up on the stage doing my lecture, I would be very rich. And by the way, it is not just Romanian students who ask, is this on a test? It is American students, it is British students, it is Estonian students, it is French students, because I've taught all over. And they're all the same. <laughs> is this going to be on the test? <laughs> Education is wasted on 18 to 22 year olds. There is a significant amount of research that shows that as we age, if we engage in learning, we will keep that cognitive ability alive. We will exercise our brains. My husband works as a CEO of a charity that works with older people. And they do quite a lot of work with older people in getting them involved in education. Because not only does it help with this cognitive, but it helps with the depression that older people get as they become more isolated and their children grow up and move away. As their grandchildren, you know, when your grandchildren are teenagers, you're no longer, oh, I want to go see grandma and granddad. It's like, do I have to go? <laughs> Those of you who have teenagers, I sympathize. <laughs> they do grow up. I recommend boarding school. <laughs> So, how do we address this? The thing is, is you've got the opportunity now. 
You don't have to go to BBU or any of the other universities around to exercise the most important muscle you have. You can do it online. If you don't have the money, it doesn't matter. If you think you have the time and then find out you don't, it doesn't matter. You know, if you sign up for a class and you pay 500 euros to take that class and then you find out work is just killing you and you just really don't have the time to take the class, you go, oh, but I've paid 500 euros, I have to take this. I don't. You know, I, I, I am finishing, I'm actually finishing a MOOC right now on social network analysis because that's what I do. I do a lot of work with social networks. And again, you know, statistics, I've got to analyze something. Um, and even though the teacher was really boring, the forum group that I got put in or that I put myself in was really exciting. And I really liked interacting with my fellow students. So, as I'm drawing to a close and I'm going to stick on time, I want everybody to stand up. Come on, stand up, stand up, stand up. Now I want you to stretch and reach. That's your opportunity. Reach for your opportunities and step outside.